I guess we'll get started. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, and I guess thank you for coming uh, to our now, I guess, second um, nutrition symposium uh, that we're going to have, and hopefully being an ongoing uh, educational process. Um, just to remind everybody who wasn't here last time, last, uh, last, uh, our last one was about cel celiac disease and gluten issues. Um, and tonight we are um, uh, happy to have uh, with us our special guests uh, talking about vital voices, youth, family, and clinician perspective on weight, prediabetes, and nutrition. Uh, just uh, our up, up, we will have some upcoming ones as well, but certainly if anybody has specific recommendations or suggestions about topics they would like to, for us to cover, please uh, see Jackie maybe toward the end, uh, and we'd be happy to, uh, to accommodate uh, and utilize some of the resources that we have here at NYU. Uh, just to go through the, um, the schedule uh, for this evening, um, after Jackie and myself speak, um, uh, we're going to have Dr. Mary Pat Gallagher, um, who uh, has recently joined NYU uh, and is director of the uh, Robert Grossman and Elizabeth Cohn uh, Pediatric Diabetes Center here at uh, the Hassenfeld Children's Hospital. Uh, and Dr. Gallagher has had extensive experience uh, with uh, diabetes and prediabetes, and she will be talking about uh, again the topic that's written on the uh, on the screen. Um, following Dr. Gallagher's um, presentation, which should be somewhere around forty to fifty minutes or so, uh, we'll have a question, a short question and answer period. Um, it'll be short, uh, and then um, our next uh, speaker um, is Angie Hassan, Hassman, uh, who has. Uh, come up from down south, hopefully with a nice southern accent or a slight southern accent from the University of Virginia. Um, and um, she's the co-director of clinical nutrition at UVA. Uh, and we'll talk about, uh, from the nutritional perspective, uh, about uh, healthy eating and obesity. Again, following that, there'll be another 10 minute or so question and answer period. Uh, and following that, um, we're going, we're privileged to have Liza Cooper, um, who is our, among her titles are her fa child and family education coordinator at the Sal Institute, uh, together with a, one of the senior um, family advisors, Katie Darcy, who's, who's, who's been happy enough to have joined us uh, this evening. Uh, and again, we'll hopefully to conclude around eight or so, and then there'll be uh, some refreshments, uh, more refreshments uh, outside um, when we're finished. So, uh, and now I'm going to introduce Jackie uh, to everybody who doesn't know her, uh, and we'll talk, uh, and then we'll start with Dr. Gallagher. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jackie Ballou Erdos. I'm the director of the squash program here at NYU Langone and Hassenfeld Children's Hospital. And I'm so excited to have everyone join us. This is our second uh, pediatric nutrition symposium. And uh, squash is a program that um, it has a long name, but uh, what it stands for is smart choices, quality, ingredients, unique, appetizing, simple, and healthy. And the program is um, educational uh, activities for kids, including cooking classes, waiting room activities, and other special events. And the program is made possible with generous support from Linda Gosden Robinson and Jane C. Robinson III. Um, at the center of the squash program is um, partnering with families, and we'll be continuing with that trend this evening as we speak alongside families. So we're very excited to get started. So without further ado, show you some pictures from our programs, and then uh, we can get started. So we, I'd like to uh, introduce now Dr. Galler um, to come and join us and give us and give us our her vast experience uh, regarding diabetes and prediabetes, etc. Thank you. So thank you. It's very nice to be here, and it's nice to see all of you here. I am going to try to give the clinician's perspective, the medical perspective on prediabetes and obesity in children and adolescents. Um, prediabetes is not just a high-risk state for the development of diabetes. It probably should be considered in and of itself a disease. 
uh, studies in adults suggest that chronic complications actually begin to occur in the prediabetes state. So at the time of diagnosis with type 2 diabetes, you can already have um, microalbuminuria, for instance. And so we really want to try to get on top of this as early as possible. And it also seems that in children, the phenotype of type 2 diabetes and possibly prediabetes, we don't know, is much more severe. So in a 15-year follow-up of children and adolescents who were diagnosed prior to the age of 18 with type 2 diabetes, there was a really shocking percentage that had end organ damage, blindness, amputations, um, and even early cardiovascular death um, in their 20s. Um, so for some reason, the phenotype seems a bit more severe, and we're not really clear why that is. But um, it's so it, we feel like it's even more important in the pediatric population to get um, a hold of this. So the de definition of prediabetes is not metabolic syndrome. I mean, I think everybody sees kids with metabolic syndrome and they think, oh, they're at risk for developing type 2 diabetes. But prediabetes as a classification, according to the American Diabetes Association and the World Health Organization and a few other organizations, they have specific diagnostic criteria. And so the American Diabetes Association allows for three different ways that you could be assigned a diagnosis of prediabetes. You can either have impaired fasting glucose, which means that your glucose is above 100, but not 126, which would diagnose you with diabetes. You can have a glucose tolerance test and be classified as having impaired glucose tolerance, which means that your two-hour level would be between 141 and 199 because 200 would diagnose you with diabetes. And then you can have an A1C between 5.7 and 6.4 as an indicator of prediabetes, and that would meet the diagnostic criteria as far as the ADA was concerned. A couple of points about these different ways of being diagnosed and their applicability to children. Um, as you'll see as I talk through it, there none are very, um, uh, what would you say? None are sensitive enough or specific enough or both. So I'll show you data in a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about. One thing to remember is that the impaired fasting glucose diagnosis, the ADA changed that in 2003. They had originally, before that, um, you had to be above 110 milligrams per deciliter to have fast, impaired fasting glucose. They lowered it because they wanted to increase the number of people and capture who might be at risk for disease. But the flip side of that is that we may be labeling kids who don't have high risk for type 2 diabetes as actually prediabetes. Um, an oral glucose tolerance test is a little bit of a challenge to have people do, but it certainly um, would uh, be appropriate to diagnose this. More, um, e an easier way to diagnose, of course, would be an A1C. You don't have to be fasting. You don't have to be um, uh, coming to have a glucose tolerance test, but these have not really been studied in the pediatric populations, um, the A1C, and so there's a lot of controversy about whether or not it should be included. Sorry. I don't know why it's, there we go. It's stuck. Okay, I got it. Sorry, just you getting out of your seat. Mm -hmm. Fix it. So the World Health Organization actually does not include hemoglobin A1C as part of the diagnostic criteria. They just use impaired fasting glucose with the same cutoff as the ADA and impaired glucose tolerance. But they also caution, and I kind of agree with this, and you can see if you agree with it at the end of the discussion, that many, because many of the patients who have prediabetes don't progress to type 2 diabetes, that perhaps we shouldn't be calling this state prediabetes at all. Perhaps we should be calling it intermediate hyperglycemia or something like that. And I, I would tend to agree. So the increase in prediabetes in the adolescent population clearly correlates with the increase in obesity in the pediatric population. So I just wanted to quickly review 
some of the more recent data that's been collected up to the year of 2015 in the United States about the prevalence of obesity. And we're going to start with adult data because it's a little more recent and more detailed, and then we'll look at pediatric data as well. The next few slides that I'll show you quickly were generated by the CDC working with state departments, state health departments to monitor a variety of health risk factors, one of which was obesity. So what they did was they made phone calls to people and they asked them to report their heights and weights and then they calculated their body mass index. So these are self-reported body mass index, well really self-reported heights and weights, and then they tracked those over time. So in the 2011, if you look here, you can see that the light green is the least amount with less than 20% of the population being um, diagnosed with diabetes. And as you move down, it gets higher and higher until we get to the maroon, which is greater than 35%. So in 2011, the United States looked like this. 2012 looked like that. 2013 was not a good year. We got some more maroons in there. And 2014, and now 2015. So in 2015, there was not a single state that had a prevalence of obesity less than 20%. And four states, um, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and West Virginia, had a prevalence of 35% or greater. So um, the next thing we were able to do is to break this down by ethnicity, because as we all know, there are certain ethnicities that are at higher risk for obesity, as well as prediabetes and diabetes. And so if we look originally between 2013 and 2015, they put the data together to be sure that it was accurate. If we look initially among non-Hispanic white adults by state and territory, you can see that there are just a couple of places, two states, um, that have a prevalence of 35% or greater. Well, this is Puerto Rico and West Virginia. And there's only two states, so it was Colorado and Hawaii, and then the District of Columbia, which had a prevalence less than 20%. The picture is much different when we move from non-Hispanic white adults to non-Hispanic black adults by state and territory. You can see that no state had a prevalence of obesity less than 20% and 34 states. And the District of Columbia had a prevalence of obesity that was greater than 35%. So clearly the, this is disproportionately affecting um, people in the minority groups. And the Hispanic adults self-report was somewhere in between. So in pediatrics, we have similar data. We use body mass index as well, although body mass index in pediatrics isn't necessarily as correlated with disease um, because it's difficult to track that. And we are looking, the one thing we can say is that when you are obese as a child, you're more likely to be obese as an adult. And I'll show you data that shows that as the population is getting older, the more prevalent the obesity is. So BMI is readily available in primary care and can be tracked, but it requires tracking percentiles in pediatrics. There's no absolute number, right? And so with um, obesity being above the 95th percentile for BMI for sex and age, and overweight being between the 85th and 95th percentiles. Um, it doesn't distinguish uh, between fat and muscle, I might have said that, and it, is kind of difficult to reliably measure given um, whether or not people are accurately measuring length and height. So some data on uh, prediabetes in children and adolescents. There have been some studies in the United States and in 2011 to 2014, if you group that data, for children and adolescents between two and 19 years of age, the prevalence of obesity remained fairly stable between those three years. And it was about 17% 17 and affected about 13 million children and adolescents. If you look at the two to five-year-old group, subgroup, it was only 8.9% prevalence compared to 
the 6 to 11-year-old group, which was 17.5%. And then when you get to 12 to 19-year-olds, it rose again to 20.5%. So it's a gradual increase, and we see even more so in the adult population. And like adult obesity, childhood obesity is more common among certain populations with non-Hispanic black youth and Hispanic youth being affected more disproportionately. This slide is pediatric data. This is uh, data that was collected through WIC, the WIC program. And this is in 2012, the percent of children aged two to four years who had obesity. And you can see that the numbers here are different than the numbers on the adult slide. The lightest green is less than 14%. Then 14 to 16 percent, 16 to 18 percent, greater than 18 percent. And there's no gray here, but in the next slide there is. The gray is that they just didn't have enough data. <clears throat> so here you can see um, that we're by and large between these two areas and um, also have a few of greater than 18 percent. The next is looking, those were children who were overweight, I apologize, two to four years who were overweight. And these are children who met criteria for obesity in that same group. So it's actually even more significant for children two to four years of age having more obesity than even overweight. When you look at children in high school, grades nine through 12, that we have data for, you can see that they have uh, primarily moved into the next realm with 14 states being here and six states being here, greater than 16%. And that's for overweight and this is for obesity. Similar, seven states were greater than 15%. So we don't really know why this is happening. Clearly it's not a genetic phenomenon. There hasn't been enough time that's passed for genetics to be um, changing. So obviously it's got something to do with environmental effects. So things that have been identified include the advertising of less healthy foods. Actually in nearly half of U.S. middle schools and high schools, advertising is allowed for less healthy foods and um, highly advertised in the media obviously outside of school in comparison to healthy foods which pro by comparison is almost non-existent. Licensure regulations among child care centers, there are about 12 million children in the United States who regularly spend time outside of the home, and there are not consistent regulations that they have to be um, healthy in terms of the nutrition they provide or the activity level they provide. No safe and appealing place. This is true for many people who are trying to be active, but maybe the way the community is made, there is no safe way to get to the park or there is no park or community center. And greater availability of high energy dense foods and sugar sweetened beverages. About 80% of the uh, adolescent population and pediatric population every day have a sugared drink. So they have a caloric drink with extra sugar. Um, Limited access to healthy, affordable foods. I know you know more about this probably than I do, um, but there have been studies that suggest that having access to a supermarket instead of convenience stores and fast food places will um, decrease your risk of having a child with overweight or obesity. Portion sizes, we all know, are getting much bigger. And although it's not clear that breastfeeding decreases the incidence of overweight and obesity, it's been a little bit controversial. It may, and certainly it would be helpful if there were more breastfeeding support programs because about 75% of women in the United States now begin breastfeeding, um, but only about 18% of them are still exclusively breastfeeding by the age of six months. So clearly we could do better in that area. So the consequences of obesity, um, they can have harmful effects on the child in a variety of ways. We know that they can have a greater risk of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, glucose intolerance, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes. They can also have breathing problems, sleep apnea, asthma is more common and more severe, joint problems, and musculoskeletal discomfort from the weight. 
um, fatty liver disease, gallstones, and gastroesophageal reflux are all related to obesity levels. Psychological stress can't be ignored either, such as depression, behavioral problems, and issues in school, which have been reported at a higher rate in this population, and impaired social, physical, and emotional well-being. Children, as I said before, who are obese are more likely to become obese adults, and we believe, although it's not entirely clear, that if children are obese, the obesity and disease risk factors in adulthood are likely to be more severe because, as I showed you, as the population ages, the percent of uh, obesity rises. So we know that not everybody with obesity or even prediabetes, as I said, are, are going to get type 2 diabetes. Um, and it's not clear what factors are responsible for this progression or lack of progression, but we do know some of the risk factors, but we'd like to learn more about the physiology. So the risk factors I'm sure you're all familiar with, family history of type 2 diabetes is huge in the pediatric population. More than 80% of kids who are ultimately diagnosed with type 2 under the age of 18 have one or more parents with type 2 diabetes. And then having given birth to a baby weighing more than nine pounds or having gestational diabetes in adults is related to type 2 risk, PCOS, certain ethnicities, um, being overweight or obese. High triglycerides, low HDL, and a high LDL are sort of a marker. And people who are sedentary or older than the age of 45 are at the highest risk. But we know as we're here today talking about pediatrics that it's not exclusively seen in adults. So the next part is to talk about the physiology of insulin resistance. I'm going to discuss some of the clinical research that's been done in an effort to better understand the spectrum of diabetes to just mild insulin resistance and uh, in children and adolescents. And first, I just want to review a couple of the techniques that are used. You may be familiar with them or you may not, but if you're not, then the next 10 minutes is going to be very boring. So, um, so we will just go over the different types of tests. So for cl the first class of studies that are important are CLAMP studies. So there are several different kinds of CLAMP studies. There's the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic CLAMP, which is as used to assess whole body insulin sensitivity. So what this is is you have two IVs, and you are infusing insulin at a fixed rate. And then you infuse glucose at whatever rate is necessary to keep your blood glucose at 100 milligrams per deciliter. And then you can express that in micromoles of glucose per minute per kilo, okay? And so if you think about it, the more glucose that it takes for a given amount of insulin to keep your blood sugar stable, the more insulin sensitive you are, okay? And um, if it takes very little, then you could tolerate a huge dose of insulin without needing much glucose, okay, to compensate. So that would be consistent with insulin resistance. The next type, oh, I'm sorry, somehow I jumped ahead. The next type is the hyperglycemic clamp. The hyperglycemic clamp measures beta cell function um, and what your uh, first phase and second phase insulin responses are. So. The hyperglycemic clamp, again, you're going to have a glucose infusion, um, but this glucose infusion is intended specifically to make you hyperglycemic. So they're trying to get you to 200 or 225 milligrams per deciliter, depending on which study you read, and keep you there for two hours. So they also label the glucose so that they can see what endogenous glucose production looks like versus the glucose that you're infusing, right? So there's a lot of different information that can be given from that study. In addition, I'm so sorry. Um, in addition, there's something called the disposition index, which you're going to see. So the disposition index is something that is related to insulin sensitivity and your beta cell function. So it's really a measure of beta cell function as related to your insulin resistant or not state, okay? So when we go through the studies, it'll be a little more obvious. And then I know you guys know um, oral glucose tolerance tests, um, which also will be part of some of the studies that we're gonna look at now. So the first study I wanted to show you was done by Sonia Caprio's group at Yale in 2008. 
And they wanted to identify the metabolic phenotypes of youth with prediabetes because not all youth look the same. As we said before, you can have impaired fasting glucose or you can have impaired glucose tolerance. You can have both. So they did. They um, enrolled um, about 40 n uh, children with normal glucose tolerance, 17 with impaired fasting glucose, 23 with impaired glucose tolerance, and then 11 who had both impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance. And these were all adolescents who were obese. Age, percent fat by DEXA, gender and ethnicity were all comparable throughout the groups. The Tanner stage was more advanced in the um, group that had both impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance. But so that could play a role. Puberty certainly plays a role in increasing insulin resistance and perhaps then having someone demonstrate that they have type 2 diabetes. So they used hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamps to assess whole body insulin sensitivity. And they also used deuterium labeled, sorry, I practiced this on this machine, um, deuterium labeled glucose so that they could look at glucose turnover. And what you can see here on the different slides, uh, different graphs on this slide, is that they could calculate basal secretion rate. And then here they were looking at um, normal glucose tolerance, impaired fasting glucose subjects, impaired glucose tolerance subjects, and then those who had both. And the basal secretion rates didn't really differ. Glucose sensitivity of the first phase response was different between the normal glucose tolerance groups and all the other groups, okay? So first phase insulin response was always impaired. So the first phase is in the first 10 minutes. So that's, they take all the measurements from the first 10 minutes and they look and they determine first phase insulin response. Interestingly, in second phase insulin response, uh, it was trending downward um, and decreased not significantly in the impaired glucose tolerance group, but they felt there was a trend to a decrease in the glucose to in impaired glucose tolerance group. And there was absolutely a statistical significantly different glucose sensitivity in the second phase response in those who had both impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance. So the, the glucose clearance, interestingly, you might think, well, how could someone have um, normal glucose tolerance and, uh, I'm sorry, an impaired glucose tolerance and a normal fasting glucose? So it has to do with their glucose clearance. So this group, which had only impaired glucose tolerance that was not accompanied by an impaired fasting glucose, cleared their glucose much more quickly than the other groups. So we understand a little tiny bit more about that physiology now. And then they did hyperglycemic clamps as well in this study, which, um, yep, so I went over that. Okay. So the next study by Sonia Caprio's group again at Yale in 2012 said, you know what, we're interested not just in people who have already been diagnosed with prediabetes. We'd like to know as we move the measurement down further and further, what does it look like if you have a high normal glucose tolerance test result at two hours. So they looked at people um, who had, um, excuse me one second. Okay, so they looked at people um, over the course of two years and they were able to see that they did hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamps at two different time points. And at baseline, the subjects at the 120 to 139 range look very similar to the impaired glucose tolerance group, right? This is the clamp disposition index. So this is a measurement of when you used the IV glucose, um, you could see that there was a decrease in the sensitivity in first phase insulin secretion, but between these two groups, didn't look very different. Glucose disposal, 
kind of declining all the way across, but between these two groups, didn't look very different. And that's true also for the two-hour glucose um, and the, uh, I'm sorry, this is the two-hour glucose for the sensitivity and for uh, first and second phase responses. So this graph shows the distribution of the two-hour glucose levels in the entire cohort. And you can see that it's sort of a bell-shaped curve. And what you can see is that the two-hour glucose levels um, in the bottom, you can correlate the disposition index as it changes with the two-hour glucose levels. So if you have a two-hour glucose level that's less than 100, then you're going to see that your disposition index is high. And as the two-hour glucose level increases, the disposition uh, index decreases. So you're having a beta cell failure in the face of insulin resistance. This is a different paper that was published by Silva Arslanian's group in Pittsburgh uh, at, in 2011, and it shows similar findings. They did hyperinsulinemic clamps, hyperglycemic clamps, and glucose tolerance tests, and found that subjects, they used the cutoff of 120 instead of 100, but subjects with two-hour levels between 120 and 140 had a 40% reduction in their disposition index. And uh, by the time they were diagnosed with diabetes, they had a 75% reduction in disposition index. So they did this with um, oral glucose tolerance tests so that you could determine an oral disposition index. So that's a lot less difficult than using an IV glucose tolerance test or a hyperglycemic clamp. And that's been suggested that since it's associated with progression to diabetes in adults, that we should be looking at it in pediatrics as well. But it's not yet uh, been validated. And you can see here that you have um, the two-hour glucose is rising by definition between normal glucose, glucose tolerance impaired and type 2. You can also see their fasting glucose is very mildly trend upward and then are significantly elevated in the type 2 population. Fasting insulin, interestingly, sort of increases gradually, but then between impaired glucose tolerance and type 2 diabetes really increases. And the two-hour insulin level, however, if you look, it decreases in spite of the fasting insulin increasing. We see a two-hour decrease. Impaired glucose tolerance is sort of in the middle there, but then you start to see beta cell failure here. And the A1C obviously trends upward with the diagnosis of type 2. So in adults, um, type 2 seems to develop over years, but we were interested uh, to know uh, in the adolescent population how it develops over time because what's happening is that we're seeing what we think is a much more acute presentation, and you can present in DKA, and it seems to happen obviously not over 30 years in a 13-year-old. You know, so a study from Cincinnati Children's in Ohio looked at 41 obese adolescents with normal glucose tolerance and followed them for four years. And they uh, evaluated their beta cell function at six months and then annually thereafter. And four of the subjects, four of the 41, did develop type 2 diabetes. They performed glucose tolerance tests as well as IV glucose tolerance tests to assess first phase insulin secretion. And, oh, sorry. Um, an acute insulin response. So you'll see that here on this graph, the acute insulin response, um, and that will come up later. They also measured pro-insulin levels because the ratio of pro-insulin to insulin in both the fasting and stimulated states, um, as it uh, increases, that's a sign of beta cell failure because you're not able to process your pro-insulin into insulin. They also, this is another um, definition sort of, measured enough that they could calculate something called the HOMA IR, which is a homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance as well as the disposition index. 
All of these patients were pubertal, and all of these patients had BMIs greater than the 99th percentile for age and sex. The four subjects who developed diabetes, similar to one of the other studies, all had 10 or stages of four or five and a family history of diabetes. Three of the four had higher BMI levels, higher fasting insulin levels, and had fasting glucose levels greater than 90, three of them. Three of the four also had higher fasting and stimulated pro-insulin to insulin ratios. On the next slide, these are in millimoles. That's what they were measuring in this particular study. But you can get the sense that there is, by multiplying these by 18, you can get the sense that you see the excursions. And then by 30 minutes, most of them are peaking. Um, and then coming down at 120 minutes. And these are their insulin levels over that time. So this was pretty impressive, the 1,648 in the third diabetes patient. Subject one, this is all at baseline. Subject one at baseline had an A1C of 4.8%, but was the first person to develop type 2 diabetes, interestingly enough. Uh, that's why they're subject one. He developed it within five months. Subject two at onset had uh, an A1C of 6.1, and he converted between year one and two. Subject three started at 5.4 and converted between two and three years, and subject four uh, converted at four years. And we are missing a lot of data for that subject. So subjects one and two had um, AIR values that were markedly below what is normal, right? Markedly below this gray part here were the normal glycemic subjects. And two of the patients, three and four, started out similar to the others. But the two who de developed diabetes first, they had a very poor acute insulin release, even in the beginning. And in all subjects, uh, well, in subjects three and four, they were in the normal range, right? So they're here at onset, but their HOMA IRs were much higher, okay? And so by looking at that, they changed their disposition index. So if you look at disposition index, which is here, all these patients fell well below the 10th percentile for um, disposition index. And this occurred, there was a rapid decline, even from the subnormal uh, disposition index, there was a rapid decline in the year prior to diagnosis. So you can kind of predict, they felt, in the year prior to diagnosis, they saw that even though they hadn't yet developed diabetes, their disposition index did decline. So this is a small study, but it does suggest that we can use disposition index to track adolescents and children the way we do adults to predict type 2 diabetes risk. So to summarize so far, obesity rates in children have started to level off in certain age groups. Obesity rates increase as children get older. Obesity is related to the development of insulin resistance that accompanies the pre-diabetic state and type 2 diabetes. And we see there's a spectrum of insulin resistance that exists in children and adolescents who have glucose levels that would currently be considered normal. Um, we need to concentrate on keeping our patients' body mass indexes in the target range if possible. And I'm going to review the assessment that a physician would do um, when seeing a patient with an elevated BMI in the next portion of the talk. So the first thing that we would want to do is talk to them about their family history. Um, risk factors are obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. It's not on there, but polycystic ovarian syndrome in the family. Any risk of premature cardiac death uh, in the 40s in the family. Then we would want to talk to them about their personal history. And the things we'd want to highlight would be the, on the following uh, slide. Um, anxiety, school failure, social isolation, sleepiness, severe recurrent headaches that might be secondary to pseudotumor, cerebri, 
shortness of breath, exercise intolerance that could be due to deconditioning or asthma, snoring, daytime sleepiness, apnea symptoms, nocturnal enuresis, all of these could be associated with obstructive sleep apnea. Abdominal pain, GERD could cause that. Hip, knee, foot, and walking pain in general. Um, we talked a little bit about that before we mentioned it. But in addition to musculoskeletal stress, obese children in the teen years especially are uh, at risk for SCIFI, which is a slipped capital femoral epiphysis, which is basically your femur hip joint disconnecting. And that's from the sheer weight of the body on the bone. And then obviously, um, we want to talk about polyuria, polydipsia, and weight loss, as well as irregular uh, menses or even primary amenorrhea. If somebody has had Tanner stage four breasts for three years, it's not normal for them not to have gotten their period yet. On physical exam, the things we'll focus on would be BMI, and you want to plot the BMI and show the family the BMI, right? We want to really understand that they're at the 99th percentile. And blood pressure, we do a skin exam looking specifically for acanthosis, acne, hirsutism, any violaceous striae, because striae are common, but violaceous uh, striae, especially if vertical, are not, and might indicate overproduction of adrenal steroids. Um, six nerve palsies and uh, papilledema could be consistent with pseudotumor cerebri. We look at the size of the tonsils that could be contributing to obstructive sleep apnea, pay special attention to the thyroid and look for thyromegaly and hepatomegaly and the abdominal exam. We tanner stage and then look at the size of the penis. Most of the time, if someone refers someone to the endocrinologist for a micro penis and they're obese, it's really got a normal phallic structure, but it's been kind of enveloped by the suprapubic fat pad. So we're careful to really look at the amount of phallic tissue after pulling that back. And then we evaluate gait and their extremities. So further evaluation really depends on the child's age and degree of overweight. They have, uh, certainly we're gonna screen them for metabolic abnormalities, check their A1C, fasting glucose, insulin, lipid profile, thyroid function tests, vitamin D and liver functions. As I said earlier, that even in the pre-diabetic state, you can have kidney disease. We would check for urine microalbumin. And then depending on the symptoms, we might refer to pulmonary doctors to have pulmonary function tests or uh, even a sleep apnea evaluation. There's something called hypoventilation syndrome, where just the weight of fat on the chest and abdomen can actually make it difficult to breathe. And the approach that you're going to take as a physician, you'll hear more about the nutrition's, um, nutritionist's uh, approach in a little bit, uh, in a few minutes, but um, it's going to vary depending on the age of the child. Even starting before conception, we'd love to have access to families prior to conception or during gestation because we know that there are epigenetic changes that increase the risk for a child to be overweight or obese. And one of the studies that um, suggested that this was quite related to the overweight and obesity in children was a study in obese mothers prenatally, um, prior to pregnancy, who had bariatric surgery. And when they did, they reduced the risk of their children being obese or overweight by 50%. So it was very remarkable. Now, Obviously, it could also have something to do with the changes in their lifestyle, right? Um, but that's a tremendous decrease. Most often, we do not have access to people before they are pregnant or during their pregnancy. And so we don't have, as pediatricians, the ability to address that. But in second and third children, we do. Um, in birth to three years, this is when eating habits develop and time when children's eating demands become very strong, they get finicky. So this is a time that we try to train parents on healthy eating and growth. Um, preschool and elementary school, this is a period where you don't have to lose weight to improve your BMI. There's something called a relative adiposity that um, I'll show you in a second. That means that as long as you're continuing to grow, your BMI will improve 
if you don't gain weight, you don't have to lose weight. We want to strongly encourage physical activity and a less sedentary lifestyle. Middle school and adolescent period, really, they have control over what they eat. And this is a really challenging time. And uh, weight loss is necessary at this point to lower your BMI. So counseling birth to three years, we talked about um, demonstrating normal growth and feeding. You want to show them their growth charts. Talk to them about hunger cues and about the three-day eating cycle for toddlers, that they don't have to push food on their child one day because they're not eating because they'll make up for it in the other few days. The Ellen Satter method for eating responsibilities, I'm a big fan of. You know, you're responsible for what is put in front of the child, what is bought to be put in the house, but the child is responsible for how much they eat. And they recommend introducing one to two ounces of water per day at age two months and discouraging juice intake at any age. This is that rebound of adiposity that I was talking about. And so to improve your BMI um, over time, you really don't need to lose weight, even if they weren't growing, which they are. So that improves it even more. Preschool and school age, we want to assess what they're doing. Eating outside of the home, how many times per week? How much juice are they drinking? How much soda? How much milk? Do they eat breakfast? How many times a week do they miss it? What kinds of snacks are in the home? What about school? How much screen time do they have? Do they have any regular exercise? And if so, how much? So intervening here, you can see this is a meta-analysis of randomized trials for the treatment of pediatric obesity. It was published in 2008. It's older, but it illustrates some points very nicely. As you're reading this table, the more favorable an intervention is, the further it will be over to the left of the screen. So while sibutramine certainly had a significant effect, uh, and there have been other drug trials. There are no drugs, not even metformin, that are approved for the treatment of prediabetes in children. None. Metformin is often used, but that's not its indication. It's indicated for children with type 2 diabetes, not prediabetes. Um, not saying that's right or wrong. It's just the way things are right now. But what's very remarkable is the next most important intervention is combined lifestyle interventions targeting the whole family. If you just target the child, it's so much less effective. So that's part of tonight's uh, presentation. You're going to hear from people who have been living through this as um, you know, adolescents. And we really need to try and uh, partner with these families to really be successful, you need to assess the family's concerns. And from a scale of 1 to 10, do they think this is a problem? How big of a problem do they think it is? Do they want to change it? And how confident are they that they can change it and they would be successful? Because that will have an impact as well. So we develop three targets for change. No more to visit. Even that might be ambitious. But this is what, as physicians, we try to do. We try to pick two dietary targets and then one physical activity issue. And in the dietary, we try and make one positive and one negative. So meaning start eating breakfast or start eating a salad before dinner or start drinking water. So those would be all positive interventions. And then one negative, so decrease juice intake, go to fast food restaurants less often, things like that. And then one physical activity, walk to school if you can, um, go to the park three times a week if you're not going at all, decrease screen time, join a sport, things like that. And then very critical is that we provide positive feedback when this is working and that we agree on a follow-up time. So to summarize this part of the talk, obesity in children can be accompanied by a number of serious health conditions, including prediabetes, high cholesterol, and hypertension. And when trying to prevent obesity and prediabetes in children, the focus of counseling changes depending on the age, but always focuses on the parents the earlier the intervention, the more likely the success. And by the time a child reaches adolescence, it is really very difficult to decrease weight and BMI. There are no drugs currently approved for the treatment of prediabetes in children. And the most important is that the most effective currently recommended treatment is partnering with families to target their lifestyle together, not just the child's lifestyle, in order to have an impact. And that's it. Thank you.
Thank you, Mary Pat. And we have time for uh, a couple of questions for those who have any. Right. And you had suggested that seventy five percent of people do indeed breastfeed. But how many what percent eighteen percent at six months exclusively? Eighteen percent. So what is in your opinion a good a time to continue breastfeeding? So at least through a year, right? That would be ideal. Um, and I think that the key was also not that they're not breastfeeding at all, but that they're not exclusively breastfeeding. And so there's some debate about whether exclusive breastfeeding protects you against autoimmune disease, obesity, all sorts of things, right? Um, but yeah, so. You want to choose, sir? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, they were just talking about the fact that they introduced formula in addition to supplementing, you know, their breast milk. Yes. What do you say on adolescents? Um, are we talking about, uh, what age are we talking about, 12? Yeah, 12 to 19. Um, I think when we do this in clinical practice, adolescence is 11 to 26. But in the data that you look at, mostly what's published is they define adolescence as 12 to 19. And so you're saying before 12 years old, the recommendation is that the child actually grow into their weight so that the child not lose weight? Or just well, it depends. Yeah, that's a good point. It depends on how overweight the child is, right? There are some kids who are so overweight, didn't matter how much they grow, they're going to be um, still overweight. So, but. Some children who are just mildly overweight, not yet obese, if you allow them to grow into that weight and you just have weight maintenance, their BMI will normalize. But there's a certain point at which that's not true, as you're saying. You know, if you weigh 350 pounds, that's not true. Another one, last. Right. So that's one of the limitations of BMI, right? That it can't tell you if the patient's metabolically healthy. It can only tell you where they fall for age and sex and size, weight and height. Um, some of those kids may actually, if the weight was a little higher, it's not at all surprising that they're tall because obesity drives um, linear growth. So you'll see a lot of kids who are overweight who are taller than their peers. Their bone age is the amount of space that's left in their epiphyses is much less than other children their age. So they don't wind up taller, but they're taller sooner. And they may go into puberty sooner. Okay. But is there any information on like, does BMI become less accurate when the kids are taller? That's a really good question. I mean, at that point, um, it is. You'd have to use, I think, more of your clinical skill to, this is, BMI is just a screening tool to kind of, you know, say, hmm, let's take a look at this a little more carefully. But if you have a tall family and a child who's at the 90th percentile for height and the 90th percentile for weight, they're probably perfectly healthy. You'd have to do a little more digging around and do an exam, but it's probably going to be fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.